this coming retreat. Have you heard about that? April 18 to 21. A great time. Time of power. Time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. coming retreat. Have you heard about that? April 18 to 21. A great time. It's up there. coming retreat. Have you heard about that? April 18 to 21. A great time. Time of power. Time of resurrection. Name we pray. Amen. I thought you'll say good amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. Thank you for our leaders and pastors. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. We pray, Lord, that you make us to listen to your word and to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that this work will prosper in our hands. That, Lord, souls will be converted through us. Converse will be established through us. I will pray, Lord, that will not be fruitless, barren leaders and barren uh, preachers in Jesus' name. Fulfill your will through us. Once again, open our eyes of understanding in your word tonight in Jesus' name. And let the power, the grace to be bearing to the word be given to every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 21. The two words I want to point your attention to. The first part of the verse. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. The word pillars, and then the temple. As you consider the building, as you consider the temple, any edifice, any sanctuary, you'll find that there are pillars in that edifice. Pillars in that building. And as we consider the building of the Lord, the building of God, that is the temple of the Lord himself, there are pillars in that temple. We look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 8. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunk hill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. Look at this for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He's talking about the whole world now, and he's talking about pillars you cannot see. And yet he's saying that the world, the earth, is stable and steady because of the pillars that they are established on. As you go through the scriptures, you'll find that the scriptures use the word pillar 
in the physical sense, in the natural sense, upholding a building on which the building or the temple or whatever structure it is will be standing. And then the pillar is used in a figurative sense, in a spiritual sense. You come to Jeremiah, and I'm reading here from verse chapter 1, verse 18. We're looking at a man now, we're looking at a prophet, we're looking at a minister of God, we're looking at a servant of God, and the Lord is referring to him as a pillar. Understand? The edifice stands on the pillar, the temple stands on the pillar, the building stands on the pillar. And it says there in verse 18 of Jeremiah chapter 1, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar. An iron pillar. The prophet has to stand. If he is not standing, the whole of uh, the theocratic rule and the kingdom of God will fall. Because the message is built, and the message is given to the people, and it is the pillar, the servant, the prophet, the preacher, that holds that up. And he's telling you something as we think about the temple of God, that is the house of God, that is the kingdom of God. There are pillars in that temple, and the leaders are the pillars in that temple, the preachers. Like you and I, the preachers, the pastors, the overseers, they are pillars in that temple. And already we read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, that God sets those temples or the whole earth or the whole world on the pillars. If you're a pillar then in the house fellowship, a pillar in that local government, a pillar in that region, a pillar in that state, a pillar in that nation, it's like something is built on you. And you better be solid and you better be grounded and you better be courageous and not backbone because if you don't, if you are kind of weak and if you crumble, if you are crushed, the whole edifice will come down. We're coming to the New Testament now. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. It tells us, And when James and Cephas and John, who seem to be pillars, Paul the apostle writing to the Galatian believers, he's, he's talking about the church now, he's talking about the temple now, he's talking about the people of God, and he's talking about the whole revelation of God that has been given to him and given to these apostles. And he said, yes, you know, there are pillars in the temple. There are pillars among the people of God. And now he names three of them. He says, number one, James. Number one, number two, Severus, that's Peter. Number three, uh, it talks about John, John the Beloved. And it says, the appealers in the temple, in the temple of God. That means then, uh, if uh, they became false, the church is lost. If they become a people that are not focused, the church is lost. If you destroy those pillars, you destroy the church itself because it says those are pillars in the church. In fact, it tells us, as we come to Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, the Lord is not talking about the future, that those of us uh, who remain faithful to the end and those who are, uh, who are committed to the Lord to the very end, see what he says he will do. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, him that overcometh will I make, tell me out loud, a pillar where? In the temple of my God. Here the Lord is giving the promise. It's not just that there are pillars here on earth. There are pillars in the building under which uh, you're sitting now. And then there are pillars in any temple. Then it comes to the, the house of God. It comes to the church. And it says there are pillars in the church. And it mentions three of them. It's, if you throw your mind back to the Old Testament, as you think about Moses and Aaron, and you think about Joshua, you'll have to accept that those were pillars in the Old Testament church. 
as we come to uh, the time of Joshua when they entered into the land of Canaan. You have to accept that Joshua was a mighty pillar among the people of God. If you destroyed that pillar, if you destroyed uh, Joshua, the whole of uh, the children of Israel will be in disarray. As we come to the time of the kings, you have to accept that David was a mighty pillar among the people and if Saul would chasing after him if he had destroyed him the children of Israel will be scattered they will not find their feet because the pillar has been destroyed the temple the building the sanctuary has to stand on the pillar and the pillar has to be preserved the pillar has to be very strong as you come to the children of Israel and they were now in uh, another kingdom. You think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you think about Daniel. Those were pillars, you know, when they were in captivity. Because if those people did not stand, if Daniel did not stand, if you did not find the pillar in Daniel, all the prophecies were given, and then the preservation of the children of Israel. How would they abstain? I'm sure you remember the story of a uh, hey man wanting to destroy the children of Israel. But God gave us a man and a woman, Mordecai and Esther. If those uh, two people were not standing at that time, when Haman said, I will destroy them. It's a shame and it's, a, it's an insult for me to just lay my hand on Mordecai alone. I'm going to destroy all the Jewish people. But thank God for pillars. Thank you, God, for people who will stand and they will not compromise. The people who will say, whatever happens, whatever does not happen, I know, I recognize my place in the kingdom, my place in the sanctuary, and my place in the temple. I am a pillar. And if I give in just like that, and I throw in the towel, I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm weary, I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, or whatever, I cannot go on, the whole edifice will come down. And that is why you think about yourself, that you don't take a some decisions that will show that you are not understanding. You do not understand. You are a pillar. You do not understand. You are a solid pillar there. And whatever wind may be blowing, you keep on standing there. That will help us. That will help the church. That will help the temple of the Lord. Uh, as, uh, now your own personal life. You are a temple yourself. We're looking at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse, uh, two, verse 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God, God dwelleth in you. Uh -huh. It's talking about your Christian life now, your Christian profession, and your Christian ministry. It says, don't you know that you yourself, as an individual, as a believer, as a child of God, you are the temple of God. There must be some pillars in your life that we need to look at. Some pillars that must keep on standing. If those pillars don't stand, if those pillars are not solid, if those pillars are not preserved, if those pillars are not protected, your whole Christian life referred to as the temple is gone. You'll not be able to stand. Before I come back to that, and let me come to Judges chapter 16 and still look at the whole nation as the temple. The whole church as a temple and the whole kingdom of God as a temple. And then you see the pillars that are there. I'm looking at Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, you know the story of the man. His name is, tell me the man. Tell me out loud. Something that man did not understand, he was a pillar. You understand? If you don't know who you are, you don't know the authority you carry, you don't know the anointing you carry, you don't know the importance God attributes, you don't know the essence of your presence in the kingdom of God, anything can happen to you. Someone, something did not understand. Little did he realize he was a pillar. In the temple, little did he realize it was a pillar in the sanctuary. Little did he realize that it was a pillar. It was the judge of the people, of the whole people. And he just acted anyhow. You know his story. Until that pillar eventually 
crumbled, collapsed. And the whole of the children, you'll see it now, after the death of um, Samson, you'll see what happened to the old nation because the pillar was gone, about to come back. Now, Samson lost his eyesight, he lost his strength, he lost his vision, he lost everything, and then he came, look at the prayer he prayed, I'm looking at uh, Judges chapter 16. And I'm reading from Vastachi, and Samuel said, Lord, Samuel said, let me die with the Philistines. Hold on there. Why did he pray that kind of prayer? Did he, did he understand? If he believed in miracles, and that's why Gideon said, where are the miracles that our fathers told us? Because this and this is happening. Why did he pray to die? There was no other pillar raised up to replace him. Let me die with the Philistines. God could perform a miracle. We we'll see the miracles he performed through Elisha. Because when those people came, he said, blindfold them, they were blind. And then later he said, open their eyes. Their eyes were opened. This man could have prayed a different prayer. And we we'll see the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He opened the eyes of the blind. What if this man had prayed another prayer? That as a pillar in the church, yes, he lost his sight, but his strength was coming back now. As his strength was coming back, what if his faith came back? After all, you know, Joshua, before his time, he looked at the sun, he said, sun, stand still there. Moon, stand still there. That never happened before, and that never happened after. Why didn't he believe God for a greater miracle? So that his eyes will be open, even though those eyes are being kind of pulled out or got out or whatever god could do a creative miracle do you believe yeah. if, if god could do that why didn't he pray lord i mean appeal you see your prayer will depend on your understanding of who you are if you say let me die you don't understand you don't understand you're a pillar in the house you do not understand you you have an essence an important thing to do that has not been finished and so he said look at this for starting now and samuel said let me die with the philistines and he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which is slew, at his death he died. At his death, it says, were more than they that is which is slew in his life. There are many people that read that and they stop. They say, wonderful, wonderful. The man actually killed all those Philistines. Hold on. The children of Israel became weak. No leader. Look at chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 6. Chapter 17. After the death of Samson, let me die. The pillar was crushed. The pillar was crumbled. The pillar collapsed. The pillar had no future. He died there. But do you know the Philistines were they regarded? They regrouped and they became strengthened. And it was still perpetual enemies to the children of Israel. But the man had died. Look at what followed. Chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, there was uh, no king in Israel. No king, no judge, no leader. Something was gone. But every man did that, which was right in their eyes. Because there was nobody to direct them. The pillar was gone. Look at chapter 18. In chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And then it goes on to say about their problems. Look at chapter 19. In chapter 19, verse 1. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. You see that from chapter 16, 17, 18, 19. We're told that the pillar was gone. No replacement. The pillar was gone and the temple and the nation scattered. They were weakened. Look at chapter 20. I'm reading from chapter 20 verse 48. Chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 48. 
And that's the last verse of that. And it says, And the men of Israel turned again, again upon the children of Benjamin, and they smote them with the edge of the sword. They began fighting one another, fighting each other. Instead of fighting the Philistines, the leader that would direct them and fight the enemy, that pillar was gone. That pillar has died. That pillar has collapsed. And all they were doing was fighting each other. Look at chapter 21 verse 25. In those days, it says there was no king in Israel. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so you understand the importance of the pillar importance of the pillar as you look at yourself as a leader in the church how important you are how essential you are how indispensable you are as a pillar a brother a sister a woman leader a man that is a pastor you know preaching that you know you're not looking at yourself as okay what can i do if i'm not there others will do uh, what i'm trying to do if that's how you feel you don't understand who the pillar is and then, well, if I go there today, that's okay. But if I'm tired, I don't go there today. And nothing will happen. You don't understand your significant. It's like you don't have any walls. You don't have any value. You don't have any kind of uh, any, any kind of standing. And then some people say, when I have this problem, if I yield to the problem, after all, I'm just so and so. I'm just such and such. You do not understand the value that God places on the pillar. And that's why you act like that. If you're an overseer, if you're a pastor, if you're a leader in any section, and you see that God has called you there, and this is what you're supposed to do, you understand? The temple is built on the pillar, and the temple is resting on the pillar. Understand how important you are. And then protect the pillar. Preserve the pillar. You look at your life and you say, if this comes in, it will destroy the pillar. You protect yourself from that area. If this one comes in, it will destroy and the, the, the pillar will collapse. Once the pillar collapses, every other thing will collapse. And then you want to preserve your life. Preserve your Christian life and protect your Christian life so that this pillar will not collapse. I'm talking about the pillar there. Yeah. Where is the pillar there? You will not collapse. Yeah. You will not fall. Yeah. Because while you're standing, the edifice will stand. Yeah. The church will stand. Yeah. You know, some people have the idea, uh, you know, it's raining today. I don't think I want to go to church. And if I don't go, everything will still go. That's the value you place on yourself. That's the value you place on yourself. Other people say, I don't think I want to get involved today. I think I'm tired. I think I'm weak. After all, if I'm not there, many other people are there. And you say, I'm replaceable. That's what you're saying. I'm not indispensable. That's what you're saying. I'm not that important. That's what you're saying. I'm not that essential. That's what you're saying. I can afford to miss it out today because after all, there are tens and hundreds of people that can replace me. I pity you. You don't know who you are. Noah, nobody could replace Noah. Enoch, nobody could replace Enoch. Moses, nobody could replace Moses. Look at Aaron, nobody could replace him. Look at Joshua on the battlefield, nobody could replace him. Look at David that faced Goliath. Nobody like David in his generation. Nobody like you in your generation. And the Lord will help you and can cast out and take away all that uh, minimizing attitude. As if, if I don't, others will. Nobody will replace you in Jesus' name. And that's what the pillar is. That's what the pillar is. And you want to preserve that pillar. You want to protect that pillar because you understand everything depends on that Pillar. I'm now going to narrow down to the temple of your Christian life. I'm looking at you now and, and I'm saying that you are a pillar and then in this pillar, this pillar is a temple. It's a temple of God and then what are the pillars in your life that must be preserved so that by the grace of God you will not be tired. And the devil will not see your back in Jesus' name. And the enemies that are running after you, they will not see your back in Jesus' name. You stand and you turn around and you say, hey, I'll keep on standing. 
Somebody there said, I will keep on standing. You will stand in Jesus' name. I'm preaching to you today on preserving essential pillars in God's own temple. You are God's own temple. I am God's own temple. I said I am God's own temple. And then you want to preserve the pillars you love. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Don't you understand? The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Think about uh, the people you think are great in the world. There's one difference between you and them. The Spirit of God does not dwell in them if they are not born again. They might be educated, they might be rich, they might be whatever, and they might be, you know, popular, whatever. If they are not born again, you have something they don't have. And it says, don't you know, you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. You cannot carry your life the way they carry their lives. You cannot go the direction they are going, because you are different. You are, you are a temple in the sight of the Lord. I'm looking at uh, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 19. It says, watch, know ye not that your body is, tell me, tell me out loud, the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. It gives us a, a kind of a peculiarity. It says that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And in that temple of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost dwells in you. He abides in you. That means that there's a purpose for life, a plan for your life. And there's something you are supposed to do. And you cannot just, uh, you know, think of yourself as, I'm just like them. You know, who knows if, you know, if this does not happen, that other person. You're even referring to an unbeliever. And you're referring to somebody who is not a child of God. And you're comparing yourself with a non-believer you know because he has this i don't have he has that i don't have ah you think that money is greater than the holy ghost you think that uh, education uh, is greater than the holy ghost and you think that the material things of this world that they have which maybe you don't have because you know you don't need them whatever you need god will supply your need according to his riches in glory by christ jesus if you don't have that thing it's either it is coming or the lord is saying don't worry about it you don't need that you have the holy ghost you have jesus you have the father you have everything somebody there i have everything I said I have everything. And so you are not buying your head and you are, you know, uh, dropping and see if, uh, you know, uh, they are coming. They are superior. I don't know anybody in the world that is superior to a child of God. A child of God that has the Holy Ghost, they are not superior. If I know any superior person, that person is in front of me right there. I said if I know any superior person, that person is in front of me right there. Because you have the Holy Ghost, you have the temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 16. It says in verse 16, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, ye are the temple of the living God. Think about that. You have Jesus in you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. He is there. And then God the Father said that he dwells in you. He walks in you. You cannot be weak. You will not be weak. If God dwells in you, you must be strong. If Jesus dwells in you, you must be strong. And then if uh, the Holy Ghost dwells in you, you must have a destiny. There's a purpose for life. Do you know that? I said there's a purpose for life. Do you know that? All of heaven is watching over you. And the angels are all around you because you have something, substance inside you that no other person, no sinner around you has. Because the Father is there, the Son is there, the Holy Ghost is there. Thank God you are important. Thank God you are indispensable. Thank God you are the temple of the Lord. But now, that temple of the Lord, how will this temple be preserved? 
how will this temple be protected and there are pillars you need to think of in your life i'm coming to ezekiel chapter 36 ezekiel chapter 36 we're talking about preserving essential pillars in god's own temple god's own temple god's own temple i'm looking at ezekiel chapter 36 the lord is not concentrating on you he wants to do something if he has done it before he'll renew it in jesus name it's going to empower you that what you were created for what you were redeemed for what you were brought into the kingdom for you are the kingdom at such a time as this you will fulfill your calling and the Lord will preserve you in Jesus name and look at this in Ezekiel chapter tell me the chapter I'm, I'm reading from verse 25 it says in verse 25 then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you that's salvation that's regeneration that's adoption into the family. That's spiritual cleansing. And that is the initial experience we have. It's the first pillar that God erects and establishes in the life of a child of God who becomes the temple of God. It says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. It's a pillar. It's a pillar. It's a pillar in the Christian life. It's a pillar in the local church. Local church. If you find a church, that's a temple right there. But if this pillar is not there, nothing else is worth mentioning. If that pillar of salvation is not there, that pillar of justification is not there, that pillar of the cleansing and the washing from sin, if that is not there, all else is worthless and useless and eternally like refuse. The first pillar. Look at verse 26. It says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and ye and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. That's sanctification, you know. Because when you are sanctified, that's what God does. That's another pillar that comes in the life of the temple. You are the temple of God. And these are the pillars that must be there. If the pillars are not there, you are crushed. If the pillars are not there, you, you collapse. If the pillars are not there, all the rest is religion. All the rest is superficiality. All the rest that you have there, all that is just religion. You know, I read the Bible, but there's no pillar. I sing, but there's no pillar. I give tithes, but there's no pillar. I you know, evangelize, but there's no pillar. The man, the woman does not have a pillar. A pillar, a pillar to sustain his Christian life. The first work of grace that it saves you, that it changes your life, you become a new creature, and then that pillar is established and is there, is preserved and protected. That's very important. And then it sanctifies you, purifies you, makes you holy, and it takes away the stony heart out of your flesh and it gives you the heart of flesh. If that is not there, there's no pillar. All the rest is just a worthless kind of Pharisaic religion. Look at, look at verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. That's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. A feeling of the Holy Ghost. That's the saturation of the Holy Ghost. That's the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. That's the overflowing of the Holy Ghost. He puts the Holy Ghost upon you. If that pillar is not there, all you have is sense knowledge. There are people that, you know, uh, you can read the Bible and see the grammar. You can read the Bible and, you know, tag some words together. You can read the Bible and then everything is cold. It's the letter of the word the spirit that brings life and the spirit that brings fire the spirit that brings unction is not there it's just the cold letter and we can go from genesis to deuteronomy and then go to joshua and this but you can tell the man has not experienced what he's talking about there's no fire there's no fire inside that word it's like you take the piece of meat from the fridge it's so cold you can't eat that you can't eat that you take that 
that water uh, from the fridge is so cold and icy, you can't drink that. Let some fire come there. The fire of the Holy Ghost. The man is saved. The man is sanctified. And the man is filled and saturated and empowered, energized, enveloped, and endued with the Holy Ghost. That's the pillar. And the pillar must be in your life and in my life. If the pillar is not there, you just be like a hindrance to the people of God. You know, you are there, you are there, and then everything is cold. And you are talking to the house fellowship, everything is cold. And you are talking to, you know, the people. Maybe on Sunday morning, everything is cold. You are trying to answer questions, everything is cold. Everything is coming from the head. It's not coming from the spirit. But verse 25, salvation. Verse 26, sanctification. Verse 27, Holy Ghost baptism. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. It will happen. I said it will happen. You know, that's how you are going to win souls. I see fruitful people there. I see fervent people there. And you will go out in the power of the Spirit of God. And when you speak the word, the word out of your mouth will be like fire. It will burn all the chaff in the lives of the people in Jesus' name. And we're going to raise up the pillars once again. In your life, we're going to raise up the pillar. In every local church, we're going to raise up the pillar. And in our church at large, that you'll find any member of our church, any worker in our church, he has the pillars there. The man is saved. I'm talking about somebody there. And the man is sanctified. Where is he there? And the fellow is baptized, saturated by the Holy Ghost, and is born with fire and fervency. It will happen. I believe. I said I believe. I said I, will be, I believe. I will be a firebrand in Jesus' name. Uh, give me a good amen now. Where are you there? Three points we're looking at. Number one, the indispensable pillar of his hallowed temple. The indispensable pillar of his hallowed temple. His hallowed temple is sacred temple. His holy temple. His spiritual temple. The indispensable pillar of his beloved, of his uh, hallowed temple. Number two, the irreplaceable pillar in his holy temple. The temple is supposed to be holy. And then there's a pillar that is holding that holy temple. And it is, that pillar is irreplaceable. You cannot replace that experience, that sanctification, that holiness, that purity of heart. You cannot replace it with another thing. It's an irreplaceable pillar in the holy temple. Number three is the irresistible pillar of his heaven-minded temple. Heaven-minded temple. Always looking towards heaven. Always thinking about heaven. Always working for heaven. Always focused on heaven. Always winning souls and bringing them on the highway that leads to heaven. Always expecting the coming of the Lord from heaven is heavenly minded. The heavenly minded temple, the irreplaceable pillar of his heavenly minded temple. Uh, this will be your experience. Somebody there, where are you? I said it will be your experience. Things are going to change. All the weariness will vanish away. All the weakness will vanish away. And all the, you know, sluggishness and, you know, I'm trying to, you will not try to. Fire will come and then empower, energize your life in Jesus' name. Tell me number one there. The indispensable pillar of his hallowed temple. Look at Ezekiel again, chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. Verse 25, it says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, upon you, on a land that toward you. This must happen to you. I said it must happen to you. It says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Heaven will pronounce you clean. Angels will pronounce you clean. Heavenly, the Heavenly Father will pronounce you clean. He will look at you and say, I cleansed him. I cleansed her. I washed her. I purged her. I purged him. And heaven will say the verdict, he is clean. She is clean. Your heart will be clean. 
your mind will be clean. And everything surrounding, that's a pillar. That's a pillar. And it gives you confidence and boldness. When there's no guilt, when there is uh, nothing, you know, internally saying, oh, but look at this, but look at this, but look at that. And you're really clean. And then it goes on to say, from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. It's not what you call idol, what he calls idol. What he calls idol. The things that you know you might be loving more than God. More than God. Idol. Uh, you know, you don't understand. Sometimes there are some people, they say, I'm born again, I'm born again. If there is a game being played, they, you know, they're playing soccer, they're playing football, and then it coincides with the house fellowship. I will say, do I want to go to house fellowship today? Look at, they're playing, this country is playing against that country. And that thing replaces his love for God. That's the idol there. And some people, it's a job. It's a job. The job is going to take them away from the service of God. It's going to take them away from attending service, attending fellowship. And they want to go somewhere. And the church that will stand on the word of God is not there. They say, but you know, you know, I've been looking for this job for a long time. If I don't take this now, you know, man must eat. And because of that, they're off. And they do not consider their spiritual life. That's an idol. All the people, it is education. Education becomes an idol. I'm going to study somewhere. And when I get there, I will get this and this. How are you going to continue to maintain your Christian life? Christian life, you know, I need to get certificate that thing becomes an idol whatever you put ahead of god other people it is uh, you know you know sir uh, they say we should be committed consecrated but i'm not married yet and i you know i spoke to that uh, sister and the sister said no i spoke to the other one yeah, the other one said and you know sir every time i hear announcement that so and so is going to get married to so and so my heart will sink i will look at my Myself. I will not tell you a lie, Pastor. I am discouraged because except this marriage issue is settled, uh, you know, I thought I will work for God before, but now I cannot walk. Look at the man. That sin has become an idol. I will not keep an idol in my heart. I said I would not keep an idol in my heart. Anything you choose, anything you love more than God, that's the idol right there. And you know, it may be a car. If anything, if they splash mud or whatever, or, or water, dirty water on that car, you come out, you say, my car, my car. You get angry, you forget heaven, and you forget everything that you stood for because of that car. It might be your clothes. You know, everything is neat every time, and if you're going on the way anybody splashes anything you stop and say you have eyes to see why are you looking at me don't you see you see what you have done now and then you know me that i'm a dignified uh, you know whatever and then they say cool down sir cool down sir and then they begin to hold you don't uh, don't uh, get angry don't get angry and then in the deeper life a person comes and looks at you and say bro what's happening here and uh, not mind them we well, mind them because now you've, this, you've demonstrated that's an idol. But when you love everything, everything in life, whatever you've got, whatever you've not got, you love God more than everything, there's no idol. That idol will vanish away. I said that idol will vanish away. You know, sometimes uh, your body is your idol. Your body is the idol. If there is uh, any bit of little pain or little problem somewhere, and then we're going to church today. Can I go to church today the way I'm feeling now? You know, I, I don't want to die young because uh, this little strength I have, I say, okay, you go. When you come back, you tell me what they said. And if they are selling the CD or whatever you buy for me, I will listen. Uh, Ah, look at that man, idol worshiper. The body, the health, or whatever it is, has become an idol. But the Lord says he is going to do something in your heart today. 
somebody there is going to do something in your heart today that when when god looks at your heart he says there's no idol there's no filthiness there's no abomination if there's anything you love you love god with all your heart all your soul and all your mind that's why it says i will cleanse you and when he cleanses you everything you know, that you know you are limping or you are not uh, doing what you ought to do everything will vanish away it's a pillar it's a pillar in the heart in the life of a child of God when he's free there's communication with heaven there's an express way with heaven nothing bothers him on earth it's just looking at God his mind his heart his life is centered on God all idols are washed away and all filthiness they are washed away and then we depend on such a person you are an indispensable pillar and I pray God will make you that in the house of God in Jesus name I'm looking at revelation revelation chapter 1 Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and from the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. He loves you. Say, he loves me. More than I can tell. He loves me more than I can tell. He loves me more than everybody on earth. I'm not hearing our people. He loves you. That love will never fail. I said that love will never fail. When you are weak, that love will make you strong. Somebody there, I will be strong. Somebody say I will be strong and he's dozing and sleeping. I will be strong. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. In his own blood. He has washed you. He'll keep on washing you. And then it says in verse 6. And he has made us, tell me, kings and priests unto God. And his father unto him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 14. Chapter 7 verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they. Thank God I'm one of them. I'll be one of them. These are they which came out of great tribulation. Not the great tribulation, but great trial, great trouble, and great suffering. They came from great persecution and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He'll make you white. Whiter than snow. Number one is the indispensable pillar in his hallowed temple. Number two is the irreplaceable pillar in his holy temple. Irreplaceable pillar in his holy temple. You see, there are, this is why you need to be very careful. And there are people that go to what they call Bible school. Bible school. Bible school, and then they go to that Bible school, and then they teach them Greek and teach them Hebrews and teach them this and teach them that and teach them administration, and teach them organization, and teach them Noah's Ark and teach them, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, teach them everything except holiness, except holiness. And they want certificate, the certificate, theological certificate becomes an idol. And they say, you know, I, I want to be a minister if uh, they would allow us. And then we go to study this and study that. And then I can tell I have a theological certificate. How many people have theological certificates and they are not born again? How many people have theological certificates and they do not have sanctification? The indispensable pillar in the temple. If there's anything indispensable, it is holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Certificate is not indispensable. I can't hear you. I said all those theological things are not uh, indispensable. But the holiness without which no man shall see the look at this. I'm looking at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And we're reading from verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. Uh, look at that word also. He said, I will cleanse you, verse 25. I will save you, verse 25. I will wash you, verse 25. I'll make you clean, verse 25. And then he said, also. That makes it different. 
that makes it distinct that makes it another experience and it says a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you what's that a new spirit a new attitude attitude you see there are people uh, they, they, they have a kind of negative attitude and they have a kind of depressing attitude they have an ungrateful attitude whatever is happening whatever may, you may do to them is that uh, is that all whatever you give them is that all whatever opportunity they have is that all and what if you you seek your sacrifice and you've given them quite a lot of a space and then you're looking you think they'll have an attitude of gratitude an attitude of saying thank you i never knew i could have this i never knew i could do that until you encouraged me to do it never a thank you but the lord said i'll give you a new attitude a new spirit will i put within you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take i will take tell me tell me out loud I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Hold on now. You see the children of Israel, they didn't understand that there's the pillar in their lives that, are, that is irreplaceable. You see those children of Israel, the heart heart cost them quite a lot. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you, allowed you, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. You see what uh, the Lord Jesus was telling them? He said, you have not allowed that second pillar. You have not allowed that removal of the stony heart and is being with you from the time of Moses. And because of that, Moses just gave you allowance. He couldn't tell you the very deep things of God. He couldn't even tell you what about marriage, about a man and a woman staying together. The hardness of heart was there until death do you part. You couldn't bear that. You couldn't stand that. And they couldn't still stand it at that time because their hearts or hiding and this is what the lord wanted to do for them so that when the lord does that whatever he gives you from the word of god it doesn't have to modify the word and change the word and tone down the word because of the hardness of heart look at mark chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 5 mark chapter 3 we're looking at verse 5 talking about these children of israel that the pillar of this uh, stony heart being removed and a soft heart, a humble heart, a yielding heart being given to them, that pillar was not set established. Look at Mark chapter 3 verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's holy anger, that's a holy indignation. That's heavenly wrath. That's the wrath of a judge. The judge of heaven and earth being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. It was still there. Christ came to them and he brought all the resources of heaven and he brought the power of heaven. They will not allow that. They will not allow everything to flow into them because of the hardness of heart. And the Lord looked at them and was grieved for the hardness of their heart. That's what that second pinna should have taken care of in their lives. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 51. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. We're reading from verse 51. And he had ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. You see, even to the time of Stephen, that was still the problem. The hardness of heart was there. The stony heart was there. If they had allowed to establish that pillar, the pillar of sanctification, the pillar, that second pillar that will take that Adamic nature away they will not have been like that the Lord will do it in our lives 
He'll take away that stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. A submissive heart, totally submissive unto his will. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, henceforth, that henceforth he should not serve sin. He will do it. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. That's not possible except, uh, you know, what hindered the children of Israel had been gotten rid of, had been taken care of. Because for the children of Israel, uh, they could they could obey that. They could obey that. To love their wives as God loved the nation of Israel. And he loved them so thoroughly that he said, it's not because of you or because you're good. He loved them unconditionally. And that's how Jesus Christ has loved the church. And no husband can do that. No wife can do that. Except that inbred sin, that depravity is taken away. The hindrance will be what hindered the children of Israel. And then they were given allowance. Okay, you instead of killing her, instead of fighting her, instead of all this violence in the home, okay, let her go. But not Jesus said it's a new dispensation and then you come to the lord the first pillar is established all your heart is cleansed and washed and purged and purified and then you come the second scene it's done also and then the adamic nature is taken away and now husbands love your wife and wives love your husbands even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it you'll give yourself completely unreservedly to your husband you give yourself completely entirely unreservedly to your wife that she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that she might present it to himself a glorious church will be glorious i said will be glorious uh, look, look up here uh, church buildings are good wonderful but church building does not make the church glorious look at uh, look at solomon solomon had a great temple now, David did not build a great temple like that, you understand? David was, you know, he wanted to build the temple, but God said no, because we are fighting the battle of the Lord. But think about the kingdom at the time of David. The nation was more glorious at the time of David than at the time of Solomon. Because Solomon came in, yes, there's a beautiful temple, but... 1,000 women with him. And then he built all those uh, shrines and all those temples for those uh, false gods. Look at all the Psalms that David wrote. That's a glorious church. And look at Solomon. Even the Proverbs he wrote, he could not follow through. And then look at uh, the Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He didn't maintain the glory of the kingdom of God in Israel. Although the temple was there, but you know, the more they had the glorious uh, build then the Christian life, the spiritual life went down. And the Lord is telling us, it's not about building. Buildings are good. Keep on building. Keep on building. We need those good buildings. But we must make sure that the life of the believer, the life of the Christian, the glory of the life of Christ is inside us. That's why it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Will be a glorious church? I said it will be a glorious church. A, a church without false doctrine. A church without any kind of reservation. A church that loves the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That you might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having sport or record or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It will happen. Number one, the indispensable pillar in his hallowed temple. Number two, the irreplaceable pillar in his holy temple. Number three, the irresistible pillar in, the, in his heavenly minded temple. Heavenly minded temple. You know, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, if you're saturated with the Holy Ghost, if you're endued with the Holy Ghost, if you're empowered by the Holy Ghost, if every vein inside you is uh, saturated with the Holy Ghost, your mind, your heart, your brain, your, uh, your spirit, every, everything inside you saturated with the Holy Ghost, it'll make you heavenly minded. 
heavenly minded. The Holy Ghost is not going to be, you know, putting you through on, you know, dust and mud and cement. The Holy Ghost is not going to be, you know, make you acquire more iron and gold and silver. The Holy Ghost will not make you acquire more paper and whatever. But the Holy Ghost will be talking about heaven. It will be talking about Christ. It will be talking about the Bible. It will be interpreting the Bible to you. It will be firing you up. It will be talking about evangelism. It will be talking about soul winning. It will be directing you in the way you ought to go in the harvest of the last days. That's why when that Holy Ghost comes, he makes you heavenly minded. And then you'll focus on things in heaven. It will happen from today. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, and I'm reading here from verse, I'm reading from verse 27, and I will put my spirit upon you. I want you to underline that word, my. That's God talking, my. It's not a spirit of discouragement. That's not a spirit. It's not a spirit of lukewarmness. That's not a spirit. It's not a spirit of lethargy. That's not a spirit. It's not a spirit of worldliness. That's not a spirit. It's not a spirit of emulating the world, copying the world. That's not a spirit. He said, I'll put my, my spirit. And God is holy, is the Holy Spirit. God is pure, is a pure spirit. God is perfect, is a perfect spirit god is uh, is fervent god is loving is a loving spirit and he says i'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk and make you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them and your time has come we're looking at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. It says, turn you at my reproof, turn you at my correction, turn you at my instruction. Behold, I will pour, I will pour, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words, my revelation, my vision, my instruction unto you. And we're looking at Joel chapter Chapter 2, Joel uh, chapter 2 is talking about the coming of the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, see what he will do. Some people say, I have the Spirit. Well, if you're born again, you, you have the Spirit. If you're sanctified, you have the Spirit. But we're talking about another dimension. We're talking about entering in, plunging in. We're talking about being enveloped. We're talking about being, uh, being totally submerged in the power, in the river of the Holy Ghost. In Joel chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 28. It says, and it shall come to pass, it shall come to pass in your life. I said it will come to pass your life. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour. It's, it is not just I will put, I will drop, I will pour. He'll pour it upon you. I will pour up, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall. Your sons and your daughters shall. Uh, you know people that say I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and they cannot proclaim the word of God. And they cannot tell the person by their side the word of God. Uh, they do not have the wisdom, the understanding, the urgency and the passion and the zeal and the fervency to tell their neighbors about the word of God. How can you say you're filled with the Holy Ghost? It says when I pour my spirit upon you it says uh, I, I will, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Or the people tell us it's only this men uh, that will you know be preaching to others and evangelizing and somebody heard that you know his wife uh, stood up in the bus and uh, was preaching he says my wife I had something somebody told me that they saw you in the bus and then you were preaching and preaching like this that's what men should do leave the men to do that don't you have enough men in the church that will stand up and declare that Jesus saves and Jesus heals? My wife, how did you disgrace me? That you stood up in the bus in a public place and you were talking about Jesus? I felt so ashamed. I wanted to hide my head. Or maybe you are going together and uh, you know you are in the bus together and then your wife stood up, your daughter stood up and then began to say, hey, I have good news for you. I'm telling you something today. The Lord will turn your life around. Look at what he did for me. And began to give testimony. And then you hid your head. You say, what? Look at my wife. Look at disgrace. And look at, look at what my wife is doing. 
Don't you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? All that shame will vanish away. Give me a good day. Amen. Because it says, I'll pour my spirit upon you and your sons and your daughters. Tell me your sons and your daughters. Say your sons and your daughters. My husband, my wife. Tell me out loud. They will prophesy in Jesus' name. And then it says, and your old men, tell me. Tell me out loud. <laughs> look up here, look up here. Old men, old men shall dream dreams. Brother, well, I thought you were a preacher. Yes, sir. What are you doing now? I'm an old man now. Pastor, I told my overseer that I retired. Huh? I didn't know about that. I didn't hear about Paul retiring. I didn't know about Peter retiring. I didn't know about John at the age of 90 retiring. I didn't hear about Moses at the age of 118 retiring. I didn't hear about Joshua at the age of 108 before 110. I didn't hear of them retiring. That one has retired. That one has retired. That one has retired. Am I pointing at you? You will not retire. Because it says, are you old men? Tell me out loud. And your old men shall dream dreams. You know, some people even, uh, they have, uh, you know, they, they sum up courage. Uh, that wrong kind, of wrong kind of courage. And then they want to, you know, send a message to me and say, uh, our daddy and pastor and father and whatever in the Lord. Uh, we appreciate you. As you are getting older it will be a wonderful thing if daddy will just sit down and say god bless you how are you there god bless you i say it's me you are sending that kind of text to they want to take your vision away in your old age they want to take your dream away in your old age until i breathe the last breath i'll be running you'll be running after me Somebody there will run after me. And then when I am through, you will do what I'm doing now. Even right now, even right now, I go this way, you go that way. I said I go this way, you go that way. You are not old yet. While you are still young, all your strength, all your energy, all the blood inside you, you put it into the preaching of the gospel. And then old and young together, men and women together, saturated in the Holy Ghost. I said saturated by the Holy Ghost. And then it says you will dream dreams that lots of lands to cover and you'll be part of the people that cover the land in jesus name and also and also and also upon my servants and upon my hands mace in those days i will pour out my spirit somebody there is waiting for the outpouring i said somebody there is waiting for the outpouring because we're told in acts of the apostles chapter 2 Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verse 16, it says, But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass, it will come to pass in your life. In the last days, these are the days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I did hear an amen. And your young men shall see vision. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants. And on my handmaids. On my handmaids. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall. And they shall. And they shall prophesy. In verse 39. For the promise is unto you. Wonderful. The promise is unto you you the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord our god shall call the lord has called you he has called you to salvation he has called you to sanctification he has called you to sacrifice he has called you to service now he's calling you to greater work and greater strides in the kingdom of god the pillar in your life will not crumble 
the pillar of salvation, the pillar of sanctification, and the pillar of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Rise up and strengthen that pillar. Rise up and protect that pillar. Rise up and preserve that pillar. The hand of the Lord is upon you. The calling of God is upon your life. You will do exploits. You are in the kingdom for such a time as this. Nothing inner will destroy this pillar. You are a pillar in the kingdom, a pillar in the temple. The Lord is calling upon you. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I'll be the pillar you want me to be. I'll be the temple you want me to be. The Lord wants to cleanse you afresh. The Lord wants to purify you afresh. And the Lord wants to impact your life with the Holy Ghost afresh. Let the fire burn. Let the fire burn all the lukewarmness and all the lethargy. Let the fire burn everything away. This is your time. This is your time. Tell the Lord he will do it. He will do it. He will put the fire in your soul and put the fire in your spirit. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that?
April 18 to 21. A great time. Time of power. Time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. coming retreat. Have you heard about that? April 18 to 21. A great time. Time of power. Time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat. Have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that? April 18 to 21, a great time. Time of power, time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. And this coming retreat, have you heard about that?
April 18 to 21. A great time. Time of power. Time of resurrection. Everything that might have been dead in your life will rise up there. 